So good morning everyone. So now we'll start our webinar. So please take note that next week, Monday, there will be no webinar at 11.15 due to the eve of Lunar New Year. So for today, we'll be covering healthcare sector, SGX, Capital DC, Maple Tree Industrial Trust, Cash Logistics, Fraser Centerpoint Trust, uh, CMT, CCT, and also our Philip Singapore Weekly. So starting with the Singapore healthcare sector, this is our first healthcare sector uh, monthly report. And so we have started with a rather basic set of uh, data and also graphs. So over here on the first graph, you can see that Singapore's hospital admissions growth has been um, faster for the private sector as compared to the public sector. The private is uh, faster for the public sector as compared to the private. And the private is a dark blue line while the public sector is the light blue line. As you can see, the private sector's growth is still at the contraction phase. So, yep, uh, Singapore's hospital admissions grew 4.3% year on year in November 2018 as of the latest data available. So between 2008 and 2017, the number of doctors in Singapore grew at a CAGR of 6.1%, and this is to cater for the aging population in Singapore. And also for the number of dentists per 10,000 people in Singapore, it's relatively flat at four in 2017 as compared to three in 2008. So the growth of dentists is much slower, uh, it's more gradient, gradual as compared to the number of doctors in Singapore. So for the number of hospital beds in Singapore, it grew at a CAGR of 2.1% between 2006 to 2018. But in the recent years, past four years, it accelerated at 4.4%. And this is mainly due to new hospitals coming up, such as the Woodlands uh, General Hospital, the Singang General and Community Hospital, the Integrated Care Hub and Outram Community Hospital. So between 2018 to 2022, there's going to be an increase of around 40% of uh, public bids available. So this will also pose as a competition of private healthcare sector. So moving on to the Singapore birth rate, it's still continuing to slow and contracted at 4.9% year on year in September as of the latest data available. And for the number of citizens aged 65 and above, it grew 6% year on year in 2018. So this 6% is rather um, flat because in 2017, it's also 6% year on year. So the growth of senior citizen has been um, at around this pace for the last few years between 6 to 7% increase year on year. So one uh, regulation policy that we should take note of in Malaysia is the B40 Health Protection Fund, B40 HPF. So it's effective for January 2019. And this basically provides insurance coverage for the bottom 40% of the Malaysian population. And it covers 36 major critical illnesses and provides up to 14 days of hospitalization income kept at 700 ringgit per annum. So what this means for the Malaysian private sector is there is likely to be a higher flow of volume into the private healthcare sector with the insurance coverage for 40% of the total population. And this scheme will be managed by Man Bank Negara Malaysia. So this will be a potential uh, tailwind for the Malaysian private healthcare sector. So for the Singapore healthcare sector, however, we still maintain a neutral due to near-term headwinds such as uh, slowdown in medical tourism due to strengthening SGD as well as increasing capabilities in regional rivals such as in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia and Vietnam. So it's increasingly more expensive for foreign patients to seek healthcare treatments in Singapore. And for Singapore private healthcare uh, companies to grow, to have to focus on specialty treatments, uh, eliminate pricing surprises for these foreign patients, and also tap into overseas expansion, such as Raffles uh, Hospital, a medical group that they've already expanded to China, and also M&As for inorganic growth. For the four healthcare stocks under our coverage, we have Raffles at Accumulate, HMI at Buy, Singapore ONG at Buy, and this was for the results a few quarters ago, and um, QNM Dental Group at Neutral. So these are the regional uh, peer comparisons, Singapore hospitals, asset-like healthcare companies, and also the regional peers 
from uh, Bang uh, Bangkok, uh, from Thailand, uh, and Malaysia. So moving on to Singapore, S uh, Sing SGX uh, results last Thursday. So for SGX, we maintain buy at a lower target price of eight dollar thirty six cents. And the main positive from the results last Thursday is the derivatives. There was a huge boost in derivatives with record uh, derivatives volume up 23% year on year, mainly due to China A50 futures, FX futures, and their MSCI NTR take up rate is also higher. So the derivatives business benefited from higher volatility in the region. And the trading volume spike in key equity derivatives 21% increased year on year, and the FX increased 61% year on year. And also, derivatives uh, also benefited from higher collateral management income, increasing 64% year on year due to higher open margin interest due to rising interest rates. And also, higher take up rate in the MSCI NTR product suite resulted in a larger balance in the collateral management income. And the main negative for SGX results this quarter is the equities. It contracted for the second consecutive quarter at negative 12.8% year on year. And this is the slowest in two years. And the management has mentioned that the SDAV contraction is due to rising trade tensions, concerns of uh, rising US interest rates, and also a slowing global economy. So investors are all having a risk of mode F and negative sentiments as well. And another blow to equities was the average clearing fees decreasing 2% due to uh, more trading from market makers as well as higher proportion of lower yielding standard warrants and uh, daily leverage certificates. So for the OPEX, it's uh, mainly due to higher staff costs as headcounts rose. Um, net profit margin remains relatively uh, stable and flat. And yeah, derivatives volume increased 24% year on year due to higher uh, demand for risk management solutions. And as for second quarter one night, derivatives business contributed to 50% of the total revenue. So as compared to around five years ago, derivatives only contributed to less than 20% of SGX uh, revenue. So you can see that in the recent years, uh, through diversification, SGX diversification, diversification into derivatives is, have sort of um, supported their earnings while securities business took a backseat. So the latest update for the SGX and the uh, India exchange arbitration, they have both submitted a joint consultation proposal to their respective authorities. So trading for the Nifty 50 will go on as usual until two months after the Indian court makes a decision on the proposal. And this is provided that SGX loses the case. So in either way for the lawsuit, the Nifty 50 license will end. And this lawsuit is mainly to prevent SGX from releasing a new product. So if SGX were to win the case, then they can continue releasing this new Nifty 50 product. So with the case in limbo, the arbitration still remains as a financial risk for SGX. And the exposure is probably about uh, less than 5% of this revenue. So for investment actions, uh, we maintain buy at lower target price of $8.36. Yeah. So now I'll pass on to Richard for Capital DC Week. Thank you, Minin. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Richard speaking. Yeah, first up, uh, Capital DC read. Uh, we maintain accumulate target price, no change, um, 152. We are forecasting a DPU this year uh, of 7.41 cents. That will give you a 5% EU based on last Friday's close. So for results, uh, let's look at the revenue first. You can see Revenue grew 26% year on year for the full year. Uh, this is mainly from inorganic growth. Uh, that's contribution from Capital DC Singapore 5, uh, Main Cubes, and Capital DC Dublin 2. Uh, net property income correspondingly was 26% uh, higher year on year. 
uh, DPU seven uh, DPU of seven point three two cents this year. That's a two point eight percent increase for the full year. Uh, take note that there was a 20% larger unit base uh, because of a uh, private placement done in May uh, 2018. In terms of positives, uh, the portfolio is operationally stable. Uh, occupancy has remained unchanged quarter on quarter at 93%. Uh, and the weighted average lease expiry of 8.3 years is the longest among the industrial streets. Uh, there's a stable and predictable cash flow uh, because of the limited renewal risk until 2020 and also the hedging of the foreign source distribution. So for 2019 and 2020, it's only 2.7 and 4.7% of leased area uh, up for renewal. Uh, these are coming from the co-location assets. Foreign source distributions have also been hedged until uh, first half of 2020. So there's visibility on those uh, foreign income. There was a small uh, revaluation gain of uh, 32.6 million. It is small, uh, it's only about less than 2% of the AUM. Uh, and this is mainly due to higher income assumption uh, by the valuer, but cap rate, uh, I think was un uh, largely unchanged. So for, uh, and then fourth positive is that low aggregate leverage of 30.8% uh, and limited interest rate exposure. So for this, at this ag leverage level, uh, there's a debt headroom of about 320 million if you assume a 40% target gearing. So this can actually grow the existing uh, AUM of 2 billion by uh, 16%. One of the negative is uh, the data center in Malaysia uh, is still underutilized. Occupancy has been at 63% for seven consecutive quarters already. It was originally at 100%. Uh, the response for this property has been quite weak and also being in Malaysia it has been affected by some uh, fresh political uncertainty. Outlook wise, still positive for Keppel DC uh, demand for data center remains robust and the manager intends to maintain the pace of acquisitions. This is uh, maintain the pace, meaning the pace in 2019 uh, will be the same pace, is intended to be the same pace as in 2018. Uh, but take note, this could be hampered uh, because of the tightening of capitalization rates and uh, limited deal flows. Uh, as such, uh, although we have accumulated, uh, but take note that the rich valuation of almost 1.4 times book uh, could have some uh, downside risk. Moving on to Maple Tree Industrial Trust, uh, we mean we have downgraded to neutral. It was previously accumulate. Uh, that's because of the recent uh, increase in price. Uh, nothing, nothing has changed for uh, fundamental uh, target price. Also, we didn't change it. Uh, 2.03. Uh, and then uh, for this year, we're forecasting 12.07 cents uh, DPU. That will give you a 5.9% yield. So gross revenue uh, is marginally higher, 2.3%. Uh, this is uh, due to full quarter contribution from the HP uh, built to suit project after the expiry of the rent-free period. This property actually has been contributing for quite some time already, but um, is to expire the rent-free period. And then now there's a fresh contribution from Maple Tree Sunview 1 and 38 Kalang Place. So Maple Tree Sunview 1 is uh, one of the new data centers in their portfolio. And then uh, 38 Kalang Place uh, is a high-tech, high-spec building which uh, they have constructed recently. So they are ramping up um, occupancy at this new property of 38 Kalang Place. Uh, you can see that share of profit from JV, this one, uh, 4, 4 million compared to 0 0.73. This is from the US data center JV. Uh, the first contribution was in third quarter 18. So that's why uh, third quarter FY 2018 is a partial contribution. So going forward, you can expect about 4 million uh, contribution. And then uh, DPU 
is a 6.6% higher year on year. Take note that last year, uh, third quarter twin, FY 2018, there was an advanced distribution of 0 0.99 cent and then uh, 1.89 cents for the enlarged unit base. Positives is a higher occupancy. So manager has managed to improve the occupancy and then the whale and uh, whale also remains healthy at 3.7 years, this unchanged quarter on quarter. Negatives wise, uh, this was the fifth consecutive quarter of uh, negative rent reversion on a portfolio basis and also all the uh, building segment types uh, also experienced negative reversions. This is also part of their uh, strategy to uh, compromise on rent in order to maintain or even uh, build up occupancy. And then the back feeling of strategy has been stagnant. Uh, so what to give some history on this, uh, there, the strategy is one of their business park properties at uh, International Business Park. And then uh, Johnson & Johnson had a, a pre-termination. So that tenant took up quite a large amount of space. And so uh, they have only managed to backfill 41% of that vacated space. Outlook is mixed. Uh, why I say why I describe it as mixed is because uh, inorganic wise uh, it's looking positive, but organically there's a weaknesses. The organic weaknesses is coming from the negative rent reversions. Uh, but you can see, like using this quarter as an example, uh, despite the negative rental reversions, there has been revenue growth and DPU growth. Uh, this is coming from the uh, inorganic aspects. So what to look out for in the next few quarters? First of all, uh, this will be the final quarter of uplift from the US data centers because they really contributed uh, four quarters. So the next quarter, uh, you see a contribution of about 4 million. So year on year will be uh, a negligible change uh, for the share of profit from joint venture. Then uh, there will continue to be positive contribution from the two properties, which I talked about a little bit. That's the 38 Kalang Place and Maple Tree Sunview one. And then uh, inorganic growth also coming uh, from the proposed acquisition of 18 Tai Seng. This is a mixed use property with industrial office and retail component. And uh, they are upgrading 7 Tai Seng Drive. This was uh, recently acquired from the sister read Maple Tree Lock and they're converting it uh, from warehouse to a data center. If you were reading, if, if you if you follow the news, uh, they made an announcement, uh, this data center is for, for Equinix. Now moving on to cash logistics trust. So uh, we maintain neutral, it was neutral and we maintain neutral. Uh, target price also, we didn't change. Uh, target price is still 75 cent, uh, DPU of, uh, we're forecasting a new DPU of 5.31 cents for uh, FY19. That will give you a 7% yield based on last Friday's close of 75 cents. So positive-wise, uh, prudent debt capital management, uh, gearing remains stable at 36%. Uh, and then uh, with this, there's, we estimate a debt headroom of about 90 million, which can grow the AUM by about 7%. The... Uh, weighted average debt maturity also has been extended to 3.9 years from previous 2.2 uh, years uh, as they have already refinanced all the 2018 and 2019 uh, Singapore dollar denominated debt. Uh, and only 6% of total debt is due in 2019. This is coming from the Australian dollar loan. So capitalization rates also compress slightly. Uh, for Singapore average, it has compressed from 6.4% last year to 63 this year. And then for Australia, average capitalization rate is compressed from 69 to 6.5. So uh, in general, most of the properties, the value has remained stable despite the compression because of um, lower rental assumptions used by the valuers as well. Uh, however, there are two properties uh, which are the exception to the norm that's a precise tool and commodity hub. I'll talk a bit more about it in one later bullet point. Uh, moving on, lower uh, cash also has lowered its tenant concentration exposure to CWT. Uh, notwithstanding that, CWT is still the largest tenant in the portfolio, except that 
is now accounting for about 21% of rental income uh, compared to almost 33% uh, a year ago. How this has uh, come about, about this lowering exposure to CWT is because of the uh, conversion of CWT commodity hub uh, to a multi-tenancy lease. For the negatives, uh, there was a revaluation loss. This mainly because of uh, two properties, Precise 2, which will be converted into a multi-tenant third building this year in April, and uh, that commodity hub, which was converted last year. Note that uh, this uh, revaluation loss on a portfolio basis is also still quite small. It's only about 1.3% of the AUM. For the other negative is that there was a neg negative reversion for the portfolio. Uh, that's a minus 4.4 for fourth quarter and minus 4.5 uh, for the full year. And then occupancy just slightly lower. Uh, this was due to some... Uh, conclusion of short-term contracts at uh, Commodity Hub. Outlook, uh, we think is negative for cash uh, because negative reversions are expected to continue in 2019. Uh, they have a significant amount of leases due for expiry in 2019. That's 22% of um, their portfolio weighted by uh, gross rental income. And then they are also having the conversion of the precise two master lease. The existing master lessee has indicated that he will uh, retain only 20% of that, 20% uh, of the space at precise two. Also, um, take note that the current equity yield uh, distribution yield is about seven percent. Uh, so that will be a bit challenging to make DP accretive acquisitions either in Singapore or Australia because the cap rates in these two uh, countries are in the mid five, uh, uh, sorry, mid, mid six to high six percent. So um, the manager would need to use a certain degree of uh, gearing in order to um, acquire assets uh, DPU accretively. Now we move on to Tara, uh, who would talk about um, the other REITs that announced last week. Hi, so I'll talk about Fraser Centerpoint Trust. Their yeah, year is in September, so this is their first quarter of 2019 results. So year and year, there's been an um, increase about uh, 3%. Uh, not, net property income slightly lower increase. This is mainly due to higher marketing expenses and car park expenses for Anchor Point as they recently took over the car park management in the fourth quarter of 2017. And there's been improved MPI margins for Causeway Point and Changi City Point. These two malls account for about uh, close to 60, uh, 60 plus percent of the entire GRI. Especially for Changi City Point, they recorded about a double digit increase in their revenue in comparison to about a uh, two plus percent increase in expenses. So in short, they have been able to increase their revenue more than proportionately than the increase in the expenses. And this is mainly due to the progressive tenant reconfiguration at Changi City Point as they have added more outlet tenants and also the heightened repositioning of uh, the heightened positioning of the mall as it is it sits on downtown line three which just opened slightly over a year ago so this helped to increase the awareness of the mall and another positive out of this set is of results is the secure that they have secured their refi and prepayment of certain 2019 borrowings and 2020 debt. So what's left in 2019 is just a 60 million MTN that's due in April this year and also some 100 million of unsecured bank borrowings which they are intending to turn out in due course. A negative would be that there's been the rental reversions for Changi City Point and North Point North Wing are waning. 
So just in this quarter, over half of Changi City Points and close to a third of North Point North Wing's expiring leases for the year had been renewed, though they had been on lower reversions on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. And tenant sales growth has still been flat. Uh, this is on the same store sales basis, so excluding North Point North Wing, which went through the uh, major AEI um, completion last year. Uh, on the same note, occupancy costs, which is uh, a metric measuring the rentals over total sales, has also inched up to slightly to about 16.6% in FY18. So this figure has been creeping up steadily over the years. Uh, this compares to about 15 plus percent in FY15. So outlook-wise, the manager expressed confidence that um, rent healthy reversions will, con will actually be locked in for Changi City Pine. Despite the, um, so this is in context of the upcoming opening of Changi Jewel in March 2019. As you, as you might know, this is the largest retail edition this year. And this has been weighing on many of the retail landlords' minds. However, they mentioned that CCP is a very different repositioning as the, the uh, outlet, uh, they are more of an outlet mall. So very different trade mix from what Jewel is offering. And another catalyst for them would be the upcoming AI works. So they'll be constructing an underling pathway between Causeway Pine and the upcoming Wood Square, which is an office building. That would, the construction would take place um, second, second quarter to fourth quarter this calendar year. So during this period, there'll be some downtime, but Overall, uh, we see this as a positive as uh, there will be improved connectivity and uh, expanded catchment area for this mall. And it was also mentioned before the uh, results that the CEO of the manager will be stepping down by the end of this year and a successor will be named. So overall, we maintain neutral with a target price of $2.21. And moving on to Capitan Mall Trust, So the main thing for CMT for this quarter is that you can see two quarters of, re of contribution from the 70% stake of Westgate, which they successfully acquired on 1st November from Capital Land. So that's, this is the first quarter that we are seeing contribution from uh, the, the bigger stake altogether. And that also includes the consolidation of uh, this mall into the revenue line as opposed to associates line. And overall, we are seeing slight recovery in tenant sales this, uh, for this whole year. So it ticked up slightly by about 0.5% year on year compared to completely no change the year ago. And there's been more recovery in more trade categories this year. So just last year, there were a lot more trade categories, about eight categories in the red for FY17. And this year, we're only seeing about four categories. With, uh, with negative sales growth. So those categories that turn around um, this year include their key segments of F&B, fashion, and beauty and health. So these are actually top three ca trade categories by gross rental income. And we are seeing occup uh, um, a very stable occupancy of about 99.2% with more than 99% occupancy each for its top four malls. So these are Plaza Singh, IMM, Bugis Junction, and Tampanese Mall. And this is in spite of the AI works that have been ongoing throughout the year at Tampanese Mall and Westgate. And tenant retention rate uh, was also stable at about 82.3%. The negatives is that despite the tenant sales growth that I talked about earlier, there's still very weak rental reversions and uh, this hardly moved a percentage point in FY18. On top of that, the balance sheet has been deteriorating. So as I mentioned earlier about the consolidation of revenue, so along with that, there's also been the consolidation of debt from uh, Infinity Mall Trust, IMT. So this is the entity that held Westgate. So now with the consolidation, the, their, debt short, their debt term to maturity has shortened to about 4.4 years compared to 5.2 years prior to the transaction. 
and they also currently have a higher leverage of about 34.2%. Prior quarter was 31.7%. And also previously, all their assets were unencumbered, but now with Westgate in the equation, about 80% is now, uh, only about 80% is unencumbered, as Westgate is now pledged as collateral. And outlook-wise, we expect the AIs at Tampanese Mall and Westgate, which had been completed in the fourth quarter, to bring in higher footfall and tenant sales and potentially rever higher reversions in the longer term. And another near-term growth catalyst would be the upcoming completion of Funan, which is slated to open in June this year. So as at end December, 80% of leases at Funan had been pre-committed or under active negotiations. So this 80% is for both retail and office combined. And to note that this already accounts for the um, the new the new state technologies uh, dropout that we mentioned as a uh, as a potential risk in the previous report. And moving on to CCT, so this quarter it was a very good set of results. As you can see, double digit growth. And these were mainly on the back of the contribution of Asia Square Tower 2 and Galileo, which was their very first overseas acquisition uh, in Frankfurt, Germany, that they acquired in the mid of last year. And this, these contributions were more than able to offset the loss in revenue from their divestment of 20 Anson. And uh, on organic growth side of things, we are seeing very healthy improvements in MPI margins, especially for the Capital Tower and Six Battery Road. And Six Battery Road is their property that's yielding the highest rent per square foot per month. And this has been trending upwards quarter on quarter. And average expiring leases are seen to trend downwards in 2019 and 2020. Occupancy is also very high. So they had clocked 99.4% portfolio occupancy. And this is the highest in 11 years. So the last time that this this percentage had been surpassed was all the way back in 2007. And this was helped largely by AST2, which I pointed out in uh, the previous report that it has been lifted about 91% to the current um, close to 99%, mostly from the um, addition of their co-working uh, co operator, uh, the Work Project Kingdom, which also occupies space at Capital Tower. A negative is that the fate of HSBC building is still up in the air, though the manager is leaning towards the options of uh, refurbishment and reletting or redevelopment as opposed to divestment. However, they did not rule out any um, divestment if a good, good offer does come along. So we pointed this out as a negative as if they do not settle this in time, there could be potential vacancy risk once the lease to HSBC runs out in April 2020. And outlook-wise, uh, we take CCT as an almost pure play proxy to the Singapore Prime Grade A market. So as we see the upward trajectory continuing, we expect to see higher or more positive rental reversions being clocked in as the committed rents progressively surpass their respective expiring rents. And as they've already secured JP Morgan as the key anchor tenant for its capital spring development, they are also launching the marketing suite for this development in the first half of this year. So you could potentially see uh, even more take, it, take up rates for the up, this upcoming capital spring. And outlook wise for, in, for the inorganic, inorganic growth, Germany is likely to continue to be one of the next sources of their overseas acquisitions. However, as we had pointed out in our report, there could be a, the mooted Deutsche Bank Commerce Bank merger. Um, just to give you context, Commerce Bank is the only office tenant for their Galileo property. So this uh, mooted merger, especially in the height of the Brexit uncertainty, could potentially overhang the Galileo lease. So overall, we maintain accumulate with a higher target price of $1.93. So this has been adjusted upwards in line with the continued upcycle in the office rents. And this translates to about a yield of 5% this year.
So Paul is currently away. I'll just flash through his slides for the Philip Singapore Monthly Weekly. Okay, we'll jump into the Q&A and just again another reminder that next week there'll be no webinar due to the Chinese New Year Eve holiday. Hi, there's a question regarding um, the private exchange news on business times regarding um, Cambridge. So this one is not a second uh, exchange in Singapore. It's an exchange for private companies to trade stocks for the private companies. So in this case, uh, SGX still remains as the only exchange in Singapore for companies to IPO. And in the recent results briefing, um, there is a pipeline of IPOs for 2019, just that with the recent global economic conditions, the management um, said that the companies are holding back the IPOs due to unfavorable circumstances. So for the equities market-wise, it's currently in a downturn stage. So for SGX, the derivatives business will be the one keeping it afloat um, during this period of time. That's why uh, we have a Bicon SGX because of its multi-asset strategy that would uh, actually cushion the hit on the securities business with the derivatives growth. And there's another question for SGX uh, settlement instruction fee, if it would contribute significantly to SGX revenue. So if you were to recall in the past two quarters, uh, we did mention in the report that due to the um, migration of broker uh, 
post-trade system to their own broker's uh, back system. Uh, SGX uh, settlement fee income would cease as of second uh, quarter last financial year. So in this case, the settlement instruction fee would not uh, contribute significantly to SGX revenue. The main thing that contributes to SGX revenue is the derivatives right now, which is around 50%, and securities is around uh, 20%. So the rest of the fees come from issuer services. Uh, there's also a uh, listing revenue and also market data and connectivity uh, revenue. So market data and connectivity increases as more companies sign up for their co-location services and issuer services revenue comes from their IPOs and also the recurring fees that uh, listed companies have to pay SGX. So all this is not as significant as compared to the derivatives revenue. Um, there's a question to flash uh, Paul's slide one. So I will just, oh, okay. All right. Uh, there's a question on SGT on Bedok Point, which is not doing well. So the question is, what's our view and in, any insight from management from their AGM? Uh, we did not attend their AGM, but Bedok Point only accounts for less than 2%. I think only like 1.5 or 1.7 or so uh, of their total GRI. So this will not have much of an impact on their total rental income. That's why we are always focusing on their top three malls, Causeway Point, Changi City Point, and Off Point North Wing. So all these account for already more than 80% of their GRI. In terms of Burger Point, I think there's always been, um, the management has always been communicating that there could be a possibility to divest this asset as um, they've constantly been clocking in negative rental reversions or very weak rental reversions for this Bedok point. So either a total revamp, a uh, total AI of the whole mall, or a potential divestment. And uh, there's a question on Funan, will the revenue be improved? So right now, the Funan have been closed for about the past three years. So um, with the Funan coming on board, there will definitely be the addition of revenue from, from them. Hi, there's a questioning. There's a question pertaining to Netlink Trust. So the question is: Wouldn't the introduction of 5G cause many home users to abandon their broadband uh, since 5G is fast enough? Well, right now 5G is uh, still for commercial use. There's not much use case for consumer, uh, and also because 5G implementation will cause capex to skyrocket for telcos. I believe 5G data would be. Uh, charge higher to customers at the start. So uh, it's still early stages for now.
Hi, so we reached the end of our webinar. For the today's recording and also the PDF slides, you can get it from our Stocks BNB as usual. In the next couple of days, you will upload it. So thank you for tuning in and please remember that there's no webinar next week on Monday. Thank you.